Gentlemen, this is now all yours. <laughs> wow. I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a bit too I much. didn't even realize how the hotel looked like, so it's actually very nice to be here. So you've been very focused on the weekend, that's why. Yeah. So this is the morning after the night before. Oh, yeah. I can I can sense that, yeah. understandably, it was a long night. It but was this, uh, this a has crazy been a, night. A crazy night. I'm glad yeah. to hear that, because this has been a long journey. This is a journey that started, yeah. I suppose, the moment you had uh, well, son 20 and years, 20 years ago. Yeah. 20 years ago, you, you first had the vision to, or well, Max had the vision, or you had the vision, to put him in a cart. I mean, uh, at that time, I mean, uh, it was only a, a motorsport where it was talked about at the table. And of course, he was interesting to, you know, he knew everything and watching Formula One, even watching you drive, I don't understand, but... <laughs> I'm glad uh, you don't do anything that I used to do. <laughs> but that's how it started, you know, when he was four, four and a half, I think. I, for sure, I have somewhere, still have pictures when he did the first laps. Um, yeah, still can't remember it. And then finish it off like this, it's unbelievable. For me, so proud moment, so it was really good. Do you feel that you get more out of this than you did out of your own success in racing because it's well, your flesh and blood? I didn't have that success, so it's difficult to compare. <laughs> but, but seeing your son doing this, it's so emotional, it's so crazy. And do you feel any sense of what your mother and father go through in this situation? Because you're in control. You, you know the decisions you're making. But when you send it down the inside, you might be going, please slow down, please make the corner. But you know whether you're under control or not. Yeah, I mean, normally I'm not nervous at all for any race. But yesterday I was. And I know that, well, my mom is always nervous. It doesn't matter if I'm doing, I think, a qualifying or a race. So. She always has to go to the toilet many times during the race, but everyone was tensed and everyone was just, you know, looking forward to, to the race. And then, um, you know, the, the race itself was not really looking great. We didn't really have the pace, but then, uh, of course, everything just went upside down in the last lap. And, uh, yeah, that last lap for me also, you know, you, you see me doing the move and everything, but like I said, I had this cramp. So all the time when I was going full throttle, I, I basically almost couldn't go full throttle because my leg was like, it was really, really painful. So I had to also deal with that in the last lap. So yeah, everything just came together. Also that, you know, you're just very tense. So your muscle, muscles just clamp up. And yeah, it was very uh, tough. You know what's interesting as a commentator watching it, when you went for it in turn five before the entry, there was a side of me, and th this confirms where I was deficient as a racing driver versus how you are as a racing driver. You see a gap, you go. I thought it was, too early to do it before turn five. I thought yeah. better was exit. Yeah. Where was your mind on Same. that? Same. Why, why there? Because then you have two straights after that. Yeah. So I was, I was thinking he's lining up to pass him at the end of the straight, but then it happened there. So I think a lot of people the were surprised. Team. Everyone the thought you'd gone too early. Yeah. Yeah. But and I knew I had better top speed. So I was like, as soon as I'm ahead, then I can control the defense, you know? Because when you're behind, you can always close, close the door and then, you know, you have you're not fully in control, so I was like, I need to send it there, and then I am in control. I think also he didn't expect that. No, none of that's, us expected that's it. That's why I think it's, he, he did it at that spot. Yeah, it was absolutely yeah. brilliant, and it clearly changed the outcome of this race and the World Championship. So we're going to have a fuller conversation inside, but it was just about capturing some of your thoughts uh, on the reflection now, because you now have achieved the ultimate goal in motor racing. There is nothing more than being a world champion. Yes, you can win two, three, four, five, but it doesn't take away from what is arguably the greatest ever fight for a championship. The sense of pride you must have to have been part of that journey. I mean, the whole year, you know, what, what all happened during, during the season, the bad luck he has, and then coming down to the last race uh, in the season, even the last lap, you know, it's, you cannot imagine, you know, you cannot make a movie and, and the outcome like that. No, it's, it, it's insane. If you took that as a script to Hollywood and said, I've got a great idea for a, for a racing movie, they would look and laugh. They would yeah. say, yeah. this could never yeah. happen. Yeah, it's yeah. It did. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, uh, it's of course amazing how everything turned out, but if, you, if I had to do it again, I'm not sure if I would choose for that kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's also not good for my heart. Yeah. Well, it's been quite divisive, understandably. Somebody wins, somebody loses. You have beaten 
a seven-time world champion. They've beaten the team that have dominated this era. It was great to see there were some moments of respect. And you've always said you respect Lewis. And I, I think we can relate, having had teammates, it's very difficult to, to really be close to your teammate and it's very difficult to be close to competitors because you, you, their success is your failure and your success is Lewis's failure. Can you share any of the words you may have uh, yeah. spoken to him about? Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I you know I was well, the whole team. We were going crazy, but of course, you also have the other side where you know they are very disappointed and and upset. So, um, I think what was nice, of course, you know, Louis immediately you know he, he came to me, well done, congrats, you know, and, and I said, well, you know, thank you very much for an amazing season because at the end of the day, I think it was an amazing season. Whoever won or, or became second, because we did push each other every single race to the limit with uh, ourselves, but also the car, you know, and, and the whole team at the end of the day, everyone, every single race. I think everyone is very happy that the season is over to have a bit of a break because it has been very tense and, and very tough on, on everyone. But yeah, it was a, definitely a great rivalry. There's been more Grand Prix in two seasons compacted together than we've ever seen in the history of the, the sport. Um, that in itself has taken the energy, I think, from, from many people. We heard there about the small conversation and respect between uh, Lewis and, and Max. Anthony Hamilton, going through a similar situation to yourself, was also here. Did you have a chance to do father-to-father -father conversation or...? Yeah, when I was sitting with Max after the podium, or before he went up to the podium, Anthony was there and he congratulated us. So uh, that was a nice, uh, that was really nice. And also during the season I had some conversations with him over the WhatsApp. So, uh, no, no, he's, he's really nice. He's, uh, I mean, they won seven titles already, so it, for them it's a bit dif different, I think, of the, when, when we win the first one. So, yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's always respectful. That's great to hear. And you hear that when we win the first one? Your father yeah, expects more. Thinking ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Should we take a walk inside, get some air conditioning, and we can reflect on the season? Very good. After the success of last year's podcast with Max and Jos Verstappen, and me, of course, Carnext have asked us to do it all again. We've put the band back together. We're going to be reviewing the 2021 season that well, I think we've got plenty to discuss. Put us in the cockpit because the world was divided. There was very few neutrals. People either wanted you to win or they wanted Lewis to win. So the emotional roller coaster was something that was, you know, it was 90 minutes of, of very intense uncertainty. So your mind, after you tried that first pass and it didn't work out, the stewards felt that there was no need for Lewis to give back the place. How did you keep your composure? And at any point, did you think it was slipping away from you? Well, I mean, of course, it didn't look great throughout the whole race. I mean, they were clearly faster. But I, I just said to myself, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to push regardless, and I'm not going to give them a big gap. And basically, at the end of the day, because of that, they never had a free stop. And that always gave us the opportunity to put new tires and different tires. And that also, at the end, you know, I was on a soft. He was still on his old hard tires. So, um, yeah, it, it did give us that flexibility. Even though we were too slow, we were still within that pit window. And uh, yeah, just always kept, of course, hoping for a miracle and, and, and that came. Well, that miracle came in the shape of uh, Latifi driving a Williams Mercedes. So that should cancel yeah. any thought that there was some sort of conspiracy who, in the most bizarre way, crashed the car towards it, turn 13 or 14, the end of the lap. At that moment, Jos, when you're there, your, your mind is probably resigned to the fact that the World Championship is slipping away. Where were you at that moment? And, and take us on that five lap journey to the checker flag. Yeah, I, um, I left uh, the, the pit and I went upstairs to sit quiet. I had my television at lap times because also I didn't have the feeling it was going to happen. Uh, I didn't want the cameras on my face all the time. So I was quiet. Raymond came in, I think, 20 laps, 20 laps before the end. And then Latifi crashed. So five laps to go, and we were hoping, we were jumping, we were, we were happy and, you know, get this car out of the way and let them race. And, you know, it was, yeah, I, I can't express it. It's so emotional. And then they did get the car out of the way. The, the cars between them, they, they could pass like they normally do. And then there was one more lap to go, you know. And I'm, you know, everybody knows if Max... Uh, is behind the last lap. He will try whatever happens. And uh, we were just thinking where he will do it, and he did it 
in, lap, in, in corner five. What I didn't expect, that's the way where you should overtake because then you have two long straights uh, coming. So, uh, I mean, and then Lewis came alongside him in, into the, the new fast corner. It's crazy exciting. I, I could, you know, I, tears in my eyes, exciting, nervous, everything comes together. So uh, an emotional roller coaster ride because he is your son, but he's a man in his own right. So uh, like you, I thought he'd gone too early in turn five. But what do we know? You know, it exactly. turned out it was the perfect move. Yeah, so absolutely. this sense of pride must be something that very few parents get to experience because uh, we all love our children. We all want the best for our children. But your child is, is representing not only you as a family, himself, a, an entire racing team, but uh, um, you know, millions of people around the world that have suddenly you know, discovered that orange is their new favorite color. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's incredible. But it's also with all the emotions there for the whole year, you know, going really well. And then bad luck and, and all the things happen that made it so much more intense, you know, so much you want to win this last race and, and to win the championship. And that came all together. There's almost a risk that because this has been arguably the greatest ever season of Formula One, the most intense battle for a world championship, it's, it's almost like a musician having an international hit. How do you improve on that? Uh, have you got any fear? Oh, I don't need to improve on this. Uh, for me, uh, it doesn't need to be like this every single year. I don't think uh, you can last a long time in Formula One like that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy, of course, how it played out. But it was an amazing season, I think. You know, a lot of unpredictable things happened. Um, of course, you know, the two teams fighting against each other. That is always more exciting than when it's one team dominating and it's just uh, the two teammates basically fighting. I have to ask, because as an ex-driver and now working in the media, I see those that are positive towards you and I see those that are negative towards you. Some of it is fair comment if there's been quite aggressive racing and some of it, of course, is just you know, biased and, and it's because some people always want to find negativity. How, as a young man, because you're still only 24, how have you been equipped? How are you equipped to, to not get drawn into that? Because we're, we're all humans, you know, we're all sensitive uh, to negativity and we all, of course, love to be praised. Um, <clears throat> that's why I always try to stay very neutral. So when people are very positive, of course, it's nice to hear, but I, I don't really take a lot out of it. And also when people are negative. So that's why I'm, when you're always very level, then nothing can really disturb you. And I think that especially, you know, throughout this year, uh, was very important because, of, of course, you know, you have the bias side and, and the two sides in general. Um, so when you stay very neutral, then nothing can really affect you. Okay. We're going to take it back to the very beginning of the season, if, if we can. So we've got all the amazing emotion of having achieved your goal. But if you can cast your mind back, Jos, to, to pre-season, because, again, you know, as an ex-Grand Prix driver, you get a feeling for a new car when it's launched as to whether it's going to be competitive or whether there's work to be done. It's fair to say that when Red Bull partnered with Honda, there was a lot of people wondering if, if that relationship could really work. So you saw the initial testing in Bahrain. Can you remember your emotions, your feeling back then? Yeah, I must say immediately. And what I always do is I wanted to hear it from him when he come, jumped. The first impression is so important. And when, I, when he did his first runs and he came out, you, I could see it, you know, and also what he said. And, uh, and then also the lap time showed uh, the, that we had a competitive uh, car. And Mercedes was struggling with the rear, I mean. So at that moment already, I thought, yeah, maybe we are, we're in for, for a very good season. And it was like that. It turned out that way. Knowing that your father prefers to hear it from you than from the lap time, do you ever make fun? Do you ever go, <sighs> you know, Dad, I don't think this car's working. <laughs> oh, I like to hear that. But, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, of course, you know, when I jumped out of the car, you have these discussions. But um, maybe I'll do that next year. Just, you know, fake a bit <laughs> my feelings. <laughs> um, you mentioned there about you heard the rumours at pre-season that Mercedes were struggling with the rear. 
But you never really know, do you? You know your car, you know the conditions you're running it, what engine mode, how much fuel, tires. It's quite difficult to actually put your finger on it until you get to the first Grand Prix. So how much of that, let's say, rumour mill of Mercedes maybe having a bit more of a challenge gave you hope for the year ahead? Or were you just looking at the testing? It was, you know, uh, in, in, in pre-season is always very hard and especially how dominant they they were the year before, you never know, right? Even if they have a bit of a bad balance, they had so much margin that even with a bad balance, they would still be ahead. Um, but then we had a good balance and we were quite happy with the package we had. And that definitely showed also in the first race weekend. But of course, up until FP2, FP3, you don't really know. But clearly, yeah, throughout that weekend, we, you, you know, you could see it was, it was a good package. Just on that, though, you say the package was good, but of course it's a moving target. You have to evolve the car. So where were you focusing your mind and focusing the mind of the engineers on where you had to develop? You always want more power. Yeah. You always want more That's downforce. Course. Yeah. <laughs> but what were you saying? Because you're the voice of the car, and clearly none of your teammates, with the greatest respect, drive the car as quickly as you do. So they're hanging on your words. They need your guidance. Yeah, I mean, I think in general what had been our weakness was the rear you know the, especially the year before we were just really nervous on the rear so that was naturally our focus to try and make that a lot better and I think even throughout the year you know we really tried to to work on that to you know to find a bit more rear grip. The emotional roller coaster Jos of standing back and, and watching Max perform out on track I'll, I'll focus on the positive because I think it would be unfair at this point to ask if there was a point where you, you had to take him to the side and have a private conversation with him. But what, let's look at the positive. What is the moment, other than that last lap, winning the world title, that you're most proud of the way he performed on track? It, it may have been an overtake. It may have been an attitude when he was out of the car. It would be great to have your insight. It's, it's, it's hard to, 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 to name only one thing because... Give us five. So many, <laughs> so many things happen uh, during the season, but for me, is is when I see his quali laps in Q3, the way he is driving the car on the limit, like he did in Jeddah. You know, that was an um, um, unbelievable lap. But saying that, also here in in Abu Dhabi, that qualifying lap was unreal, and that's he has such a special feeling in the car. It's, a, yeah, it's incredible. So you probably don't know what that special feeling is because you have it. A little bit like I didn't know why I couldn't go faster because I didn't have it. Um, it, I, it looks like it comes very easy to you. But of course, you talk about a cramp that you experienced during the race. <laughs> you know, Lewis has spoken about some of the, the, the Grand Prix being the toughest of his career. This is a hard physical challenge. Yep. So... Uh, you know, put us in the cockpit or put us inside your mind. How, how do you, uh, you know, focus your energy and, and what do you find the most taxing part of being a Grand Prix driver? Well, a lot of things go through your mind every single race, uh, when it's going well or not. You know, you, you're thinking a lot in your head, like, uh, is this going to go well? It's not, and then you see it's not going to go well. But I always keep telling myself, you know, don't give up, don't give up. Just keep pushing, keep trying to, every lap, try to be, you know, smooth, try to hit apexes nice, try to be nice on tires. <clears throat> and that constant, like, telling yourself, don't give up, keep, keep at it. Keep, like, you know, the last race, it didn't look great, we were way too slow and I couldn't keep up. And I just kept telling myself, something might happen. You never know until the last corner of the last lap. So I just kept telling myself, just do the best you can, keep pushing, keep pushing yourself. Um, and these things come back quite often throughout the race, when you're in the lead or catching or second, third. Yeah. Is, is this something that you just have inherently in your makeup, or is this something you worked <laughs> on together in karting? Well, before I would have my dad like uh, next to the, the go-kart track telling me, go, go, like this. He would almost like jump onto the track to try and make me go faster. <laughs> I, I never forget the, the images of... I, I even did that in Formula 3. Of even yeah, Raymond, pit wall. Raymond telling me, just go to the pit wall, get, you know, go. And, and we did, and sometimes it helped, I must say. He saw me like a lunatic, I was uh, <laughs> sending him, you know. Everyone was holding quicker. the pit board, <laughs> and <laughs> it's I was, my dad. And I was hanging over the wall, you know, tell him to go quicker. So for sure, or, that's still in his mind. Or you would do like this, smooth driving. Is that right? So that's yeah. the signal. It's smooth driving. Yeah. 
you haven't been able to do that for some time. Not you know, you went, one. Yeah, Formula I'm One. That, that, that would be funny. <laughs> no, no. It's, uh, he doesn't need it now. I mean, I think in all the years we we, we spent together, I think it's it, it's in him. You know, it's inside him, and he doesn't need it anymore. And he knows how to qualify. I think in the beginning of his career in Formula Three, he was still finding that. Um, how you say, perfect lap. And I think during this Formula One career, he improved on that quite a lot. And now he is, I mean, he's the man to beat in qualifying, 100%. And on track, of course. Well, uh, there's no question to that statement because you sit here as the world champion. So you can back that up with more pole positions this year than anyone else, more victories this year than anyone else. It's quite... You know, it's quite a say, season to reflect on when you look at the amazing names that have come through the sport. I've never actually asked you, of all of the sort of big names, whether it was a Schumacher or Senna, whoever the names of the drivers that have won multiple championships, is there one that you resonated with, either from a time when you were watching or when you read the history books, someone that you connect with as a, as a race driver? Well, uh, at the moment, I, I have a really good friendship with, with Fernando. Uh, because already, you know, when I, when I was still in go-karting, I really liked his style. You know, he's also that never give up and real fighter. Of course, unfortunately, now the last few years, he hasn't been able to do that at the front just because he doesn't have the car. But I like his attitude. You know, he's really on fire. And also, you know, his drive and motivation at, at his age to still be there in Formula 1 and wanting to be there for a longer time. And he always wants to win. You know, he always wants to do the best. For me, that's uh, it's really nice to, to see. Yeah, he is remarkable at 40 years old yeah. to still have that motivation. Let's imagine, though, throw it forward, if he gets a more competitive car, you're going wheel to wheel, you may respect him and he may be a friend, but you're going to send it. Uh, of course, then it's a different story, but we will still be, of course, you know, re respecting each other a lot. Um, but I, I would like to see him back at the front. You know, he really deserves it. And of course, you know, he's a two-time world, world champion. Uh, but like I said, it's just also really nice just to talk to him and see how he thinks about the situations. So again, if we sort of look back on the season, just moving it forward, it's easy now just to go with the champions, the job was done. But we all know that in this industry, even if you win a Grand Prix, you have a very important debrief, not to look at all the things you did right, but the areas that you can improve. So if you reflect on the year now, what was a Grand Prix that you personally felt that maybe it was not your best race, uh, driving-wise, or an area that you feel as a team <coughs> that you sat down afterwards and said, guys, we're better than this. We, we can improve on this. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I can't really recall a, a, a specific race right now, but you know, qualifying sometimes didn't go to plan just because we couldn't get the tires working or whatever. That was even in Silverstone, the case, and qualifying it didn't go well. Hungary was not good, you know, these kind of things. So every single weekend you can do things better in terms of especially tire prep, but also setup of the car. Did we make the right? choice from qualifying to the race in terms of how the car was performing. Even Abu Dhabi, you know, did we actually do the right thing for the race? Maybe not in terms of how we set up the car. So yeah, there are always, of course, things to, to look at and for sure try and improve for, for next year as well. Just, you know, to, of course, the cars are going to be completely different, but you can always learn from it. And you're stepping back because you're not immersed in the engineering, you're not immersed in the driving, you're there as a support system for your son. Do you feel that you can sometimes see things and, and you have a position to be able to either discuss that with Max or can you go to Christian or, or Helmut Marco and just sit down and have an open conversation? How do you, how do you handle that side of it? No, I must say, I, I really step back on that, uh, on that side. I mean, also, as you know, David, the, the, uh, how the cars are today, it's completely different than in our time. And uh, I like to hear it, but I don't interfere at all. I speak to Max's engineer because I like GP a lot, but it's only very br briefly and, you know, but I like that and, and not more than that, you know, I'm, I'm happy not to get you know, involved, you know, and I don't want to, so it's good, it's good like this. If you look back on the season, what was the race where you, you really were surprised by the performance that you were able to get from the car or the Grand Prix and, and Mercedes looked like they were somehow slipping away in the championship? Well, I, I think the two Austria races, I mean, when you look at the track, it's not our track. Like, it just doesn't look like it's suited for our car. But all the time when we go there, we are quick. <laughs> we don't know, really, why we are that good. We, we know why the car is working well and stuff, but we don't know why we are, you know, that far ahead of the others. 
So, you know, it's sometimes you have these kind of, like Mexico as well, of course the altitude helps, but we are always quick there. Sometimes Austin. the car is just suited to, to I attract. Think Austin as well. Austin, Austin really I was very surprised to be on pole, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. And also to win it. I mean, they were. Nah, we, we, even in the Mercedes race, we were too slow, yeah. but we, we still managed to, yeah. to, to win the race. Yeah. It was a brilliant piece of strategy that won you the race there. And I think that what I hope the viewers of this will, will appreciate and get an insight to is, is the honesty of how teams, you don't always know why you're quick. You know, yeah. you, everyone thinks that Formula One is so much detail, engineering, and it's science, and everybody knows everything. But there are moments you just can't explain. And I think you've shared that with us uh, very well. Um, when, when we look at how the, the championship was ebbing and flowing, you say you always look on the positive, which I think you can do a whole self-help book or videos to get a lot of people could benefit from, from that p positive mental attitude. But in terms of keeping the energy across the season, you, you have to have the right diet, the right training, the right downtime, positive distractions. So yeah. we know what you do when you're at the track. What, what is your positive distraction when you're away from the track? Do you, do you go out in the ocean? Do you Sim go, racing. <laughs> Sim racing. So more driving. Yeah, uh, because it keeps me, you know, just ready to go. I, because you, I'm spending a lot of time also then on the setup and diff, is, I'm not racing a Formula One car on the simulator but it's like GT cars, so it's also a different technique of driving. So I just keep testing myself, and especially, you know, these sim drivers, they're so quick. You know, they, they, it's very interesting to see them drive because they have no real experience of a car. But somehow, when you look at how they're braking, how they're going through, it, it is how it should be. So it's very uh, interesting for me, you know, to then compare myself to them because they're naturally quick on the sim. I'm naturally quick in real life. And then, for me, that's another motivation because I know whatever, you know, I, I'm confident that when I jump in a real car, I'll be quick. But on the simulator, these guys are the benchmark and I have to push myself to that limit. So I like to, to just test myself and, and improve myself to also learn from them. So my downtime, downtime, I'm still trying to improve myself, which I think also helps me in real life. When you're on the simulator, are, are you driving a Grand Prix car? Or are you, are you GT dri cars. So GTs, yeah, so, mainly. so they're better on sims. So even like LMP2 cars, whatever, yeah. yeah. And you have your own team or you're part of a team? Yeah. What, what is the team called? Is uh, it team Redline. So we have a lot of drivers and you know, they, they're also there. We had a, an amazing year. We've won all, basically almost everything within you know, the sim racing community. So that was also a lot of fun to be part of because I was having a good time on track, of course, winning in Formula One, but also sharing these moments with them and actually also sometimes being part of the lineup, winning these races, you know, it's just amazing because it's the same, you know, you're also pushing flat out. You need to take it seriously. You really need to, you know, work together to make it happen because also there you can change a lot of things on the setup. And then it's all about preparation, strategy as well, because when you're doing a 24 hour race, around the Nordsch life, uh, it's, it's quite tough. It's crazy, yeah, David, when it, you hear them talking I, about sim. I know, I don't like driving a sim. Me, I can't do too. a lap without dizzy. crashing. <laughs> you get dizzy? I get, I get dizzy. And he is so involved and so motivated to be the same as he is in, in, for Formula One, he's on the sim. Well, even during the F1 weekends, uh, when I jump out of my car, I would be on Discord, like texting the guy, hey guys, like how is it going if they would have a race or like keep me updated with setup things, ideas to try, all these kind of things. Yeah. So this is your positive distraction yes. when you go there. One thing I'm really curious is, you know, and you said it there, you know when you jump in the real car, you can drive it to its limit. You've, through what you've explained there, acknowledged that some of the simulator drivers are maybe a little bit quicker than you or better than you I, for whatever reason. It takes me a little bit longer to, to be really competitive, that's for sure. So how does that psychologically work for you? Because on one hand, you're there as a professional Grand Prix driver, owning the moment, knowing you're, you're the quickest guy out there. On the other hand, you're looking at these professional sim racers and having to go, God, I'm letting the team down because it's taking me longer to get up to speed. Yeah, but then I'm, I, I'm still confident that I'll get to, to that point, but I just need to work a little bit harder for it. But that's also a nice motivation and a, a nice thing to do. You know, I, like, I need to put in a few more hours to, to be competitive. And, uh, and then I'm like, well, anyway, if the race is starting, we'll get the other teams anyway. A few uh, more hours. A few more hours. Well, I tell... 40 hours of yes, preparation I for a 24 you, hour race. I think it's a 40, kind of... 50, it's 40, 50 hours of preparation before... Because I want to win whatever I do. I want to go to not to look like an idiot. So when I'm on the simulator, I'm also flat out. 
So there's the thing, again, the realization, I'm so used to being the idiot that uh, I've, I've just not pushed myself hard <laughs> enough in life. It is fascinating. So look, if we, if we get a bit more into the season specific highs and lows, um, because I think there'll be moments that we can all agree were transitional moments for, for the, the season. So if I can put you back in Baku, Azerbaijan, you're leading the Grand Prix, everything looks like it's under control, the tire blows. And as yeah. far as I know, we still don't have an official explanation as to whether a cut from a curb or whether it was just a, a, a specific failure. But there, there's that sort of iconic little, what do you call it, a gif, where you get out and kick the, <laughs> kick the car in frustration. But take us back there where your mind was at that time. Yeah, of course, you know, I was already counting the points, what I would gain. But, you know, um, racing can be very unpredictable. And that showed in, in, in Baku. And that was, at the end of the day also, it could have been a very crucial differentiator in, in, I mean, if I would have won that race, then we wouldn't have even been, I think, in the situation here in Abu Dhabi where everything was so tense and exciting. But, yeah, it's part of it and you have to deal with it and it's not nice, but that you know that that can happen and it can happen to you, it can happen to, to anyone. Well, I think if I come to you, Jos, and move to the next big incident, tire failures, mechanical failures, these things happen. Silverstone, a crash through contact, you've got mixed emotions, I completely understand, because one, you know that that is affecting not only the potential health of your son, so that's the first priority, but you know there's big points being lost there. So. If you can maybe sort of tell us where yeah. you were. Were you I actually mean, at Silverstone? I don't recall. Of course, you know, when, when you see that happening with such a big impact, you don't think of anything else. You know, I run down the stairs. I, I had to go to the med medical center. Just wanted to see him and how he's doing. And then afterwards, you know, you, you look at the incident and how things are happening. And I have my own view of, about, you know, what happened there. But also after the season, you know, they were celebrating like... Uh, like the one the championship, Toto and, and, and the driver. And I was sitting with him in the hospital to see if everything is, is all right. Uh, as a dad, I don't like that. I mean, there's, you, you can't, you know, you, you, you put someone in the hospital and then they're celebrating like crazy. I, for, for me, that was very difficult to handle. So that was a, a low point for you personally. Few people, thankfully, will ever experience that sort of impact, that speed. You're a professional racing driver. You, you've, you've kind of become not numb to crashes, but it's part of whether you're in karting or within cars, it happens sometimes. Yep. That accident, you, you know, does it, did it change anything in your mind in terms of the focus for the championship? Or how were you feeling at that time? Uh, no, it, it didn't change anything for, for the championship or how, the way I was racing or whatever, but it was definitely not a, a nice impact. And, especially the days after, you know, you really felt bad, like sore everywhere. And uh, you, you don't want to, ha to have these things happening to you uh, too many times. But <clears throat> I also knew that was a big points hit. So I was like, well, that, you know, potentially might be a big difference at the end of the, the season. Um, but I was like, well, it doesn't matter. We just go again, you know, we keep on pushing, we keep trying and that's what we did. But then we went to Hungary, we had another shunt. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, also that is racing at the end of the day. You, you just can't control these things. What I find amazing is, you know, you have such a big impact. And you, you, you have one for sure. I have one. And then the next time back in the car, how is he going to react? That was important for me. You know, I spoke with, with the team about it, with GP about it, you know. Yeah, give him time and, you know. But then his first lap in, in, in uh, okay. Hungary, <laughs> I was... Unbelievable again. He was so he jumped out with a big accident. The next time back in the car, he was flat out, you know, flat out, but really fast on the first lap again. And that was for me a sign it's okay. So, another consideration that you have as a father that, of course, the race fans wouldn't be aware of. So, you were just a little bit nervous. Had it taken an edge off, would it take longer to get back up to speed? Yes, because I had it myself. Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, I did do a sim race in between, though. So you got your eye back in. But what's the worst that can happen in a simulator? You, 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 the air conditioning's yeah. not good in your apartment. But it was, just, it was because um, they, didn't, they told me for a few days I was not allowed to be on screens and TVs. Like I just had to rest my brain after the, the incident. Um, and then basically I did also the, the, the endurance race on the sim just to see if everything was working well, that I didn't get dizzy or, or whatever. And 
it was fine. The first few laps were a bit, you know, the focus was a bit off. But I think it was nice just to get back into it. And then, of course, the fun car, everything was miles faster. But also that, like my dad says, I, I could feel that everyone was a bit like, how is it going to be? But also for me, that's a motivation to show them, like, no, it's going to be fine. Christian looked and he's, uh, same Christian was thinking, you know, he was, a, and that, then it was fine. That's a, that's a nice, nice piece of insight. Well, the roller coaster continued. We went to Monza, and by the fate of the racing gods, I think Lewis had had uh, a bad stop, which had put him out of sequence. You'd had a bad pit stop in, in terms of the tire change, and you end up meeting at the first chicane, and it happened again. Thankfully, in, in less violent terms, the coming together, but that surely has to be one of the iconic shots of the history of Formula One your car sitting on top of Lewis's car. Seemingly, you, you guys are inseparable across this season. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it was, of course, not great, that, that whole situation. I, yeah, of course, I, I got a penalty for it, which I didn't agree with, but it, it is, I think, it's going to be an iconic shot for sure. Luckily, everyone was safe as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was an interesting... Uh, way of how we were on top of each other, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe you can get a picture and sign it to Lewis for Christmas as a, you know, a light, I think like being soon on top. We, can, we can laugh about it all, that's yeah. for sure. No, well, thankfully, there, yeah. was, there was no serious injury to, to either of you. Throwing it forward further, we have the first Dutch Grand Prix since the 80s, I think it was. 85. 85. You've got Holland watching. You, you've got this incredible fan base that you've managed to, to inspire people to want to go to support you, the Orange Army, you know, it's, the pressure is building, seemingly, it appears to the outside. Everyone's asking you, are you under pressure? You're, you, you must be getting fed up and pissed off with all the same line of questionings, because you don't just handle it with British TV, you have it with the French and the Italians, it's part of being a professional driver. You then go out and drive an incredible Grand Prix, seemingly under the most intense pressure from Lewis, and win it. Can you now acknowledge whether you did feel a little bit of pressure or... Besides just... the last Grand Prix, I think that was the race here where I felt a bit, of course, more pressure than, than other ones because, you know, everyone expected me to win there, the fans, you know, it was like, you know, uh, Max is coming here and he's going to do it, he's going to win. But, of course, we were in this tense battle and, you know, the, it was going a bit up and down in terms of performance. But, yeah, the whole weekend, of course, I wanted it to be perfect and it was basically almost perfect. You couldn't have done a better pole position in winning the race, but also the way in the race, you know, they really threw everything at me with strategy, with the two cars, you know, playing a different one. And uh, we still managed to, to win it. So it was an, uh, an amazing feeling. But also when I crossed the line, I was also relieved. I was like, the weekend is done. I'm like, I can rest now. <laughs> yeah, it takes some time off to reflect. Yeah. Um, you're in this unique situation because you're uh, based in Monaco. Um, you you uh, had part of your childhood in, in Belgium. Uh, you're of Dutch descent, of course, so you can claim the Belgian Grand Prix as a home race, the Zandvoort Grand Prix in, in Holland as the home race, and Monaco, which hasn't always been kind to you in the past. Yeah, the walls kept moving. They kept moving. <laughs> <laughs> but this time... I'm so surprised. Always she came at me. Yeah. This time they weren't like magnets. You were somehow able to find your way through kissing the barriers and, and get the victory. It, does that mean more yeah. to you because it's the street circuit and they've got all the history? I, I just, you know, up until then, it's like, I don't even have a podium here. Like, it's insane. And, okay, most of it, most of the time it was my own fault that I didn't get to the podium or win a race there because we had two years where we had a really good car before this year. To, to win it, and I basically, two times I, I blew it myself. But um, yeah, it was something, of course, you want, you want to achieve, first of all, podium, but then, of course, we, we won it. But also, again, it was not a straightforward weekend because I was on for the pole lap, then a red flag, of course, in the laps. I couldn't actually claim pole position. At the end, I, I started first because of Charles not starting. Uh, but I also felt a bit like, that should have been my spot anyway on the lap I was on. So still, I was like, Monaco is still not kind to me, you know, with all these things still happening. But then we managed to, to win the race, and I was like, that's done as well. You know, it's like Monaco is won now. It is a great Grand Prix to win, isn't it? To, yeah, to... Well, it's just that the focus you need to have is so much higher than any other track because of it being so narrow. 
You also have other street circuits, but you have a bit of time to rest, there is a bit more space, you have runoff areas here. You don't, you know, a little lockup or a mistake, you're in the wall, you turn in a little bit too early, the corner is off. You know, it's, it's some street circuits, at least you have a curb or whatever, you know, you, you can clip, or, but not in Monaco, so, yeah, okay, you're not driving on the limit all the time in the race, but that sometimes is a danger as well because you then tend to relax and then you make a mistake. So you have to keep telling yourself every lap, focus, don't relax, you know, just keep at it. So it, it is a very challenging race. It's many laps. Yes, did you have a, a knack for street circuits? I don't recall your well, results. Also, Monica. Monica was not kind to me. Was not kind to the family <laughs> until this year. Right. You, you <laughs> hit a few <laughs> barriers. Yeah, I did. But different places than he does. So uh, we yeah. claimed every <laughs> guardrail now around the track. <laughs> <laughs> you should rename the, the, the barriers uh, as well as having your name on the trophy. Yeah. Yeah. If we look to the future, you, this championship will forever be with you. Your name is now there in, in Grand Prix history. But of course, Formula One is about constant improvement. So where do you improve? How do you improve on this season? You, you will, of course, gain life experience because you're now at the age that I first started in Formula One and I was a kid at 24. Like you're so much more mature than I was. I don't know how you feel. You were a bit younger than me when I, I started in Formula One. I think One. we st started at the same year. Yeah, well, but you're a bit younger than me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I must say, when I look at him, he's so far further than I was at my age. But it's also, I think it's um, the way he raced in, in motorsport. We were always talking about things. He knew so much more than I ever did in, 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 in racing, you know. When he did his fir first test, I remember, it was in Pembury in the Formula Renault. What was important, I told him, make sure if you fully in the braking, that the car is moving with the brake balance, because then you have more front grip. It was so, I had to find out myself, and probably I found it out in Formula 3 at the end of, uh, of the year. But that was his first thing he had to do in the racing car, you know, and, it's, and that's only a small part, you know, and it's so much more, and he's, he knew so much more than, than I ever did, and that's, that's very good. Actually, that's an interesting point because you could influence in a positive way Max as a young driver when he was having these first-time experiences like driving in Pembury in, in this car. Clearly, we, you, know, you can't help him now when it comes to driving. He's, yeah. he's in another, another era. So what would you as a father see as areas that you can help him if it's not on track? He, he's a grown man. He's living his life. But you know, the fathering instinct is always there. Yeah. Well, I don't think I, I, I need to teach him anything anymore. I did, I did that before this. Uh, he so. told me a few times also to shut up because I was just asking so many questions <laughs> when I was little <laughs> in the van, like driving back so from Max, the country. Please stop talking now. <laughs> He's that... always asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, for you then, what area do you, do you feel that you will, will uh, work on or are you just taking the life journey and the opportunities as they come? Yeah, for me, I always say to myself, you're never perfect in any area. So let's say you're at 98%, whatever you can call it. I always look at it, I can always improve because it's not, I can improve massively in this or massively in that. It's just tiny things or how can I try to influence the weekend a bit better? You know, how can I prepare myself better? How can I make sure that I understand the balance of the car better for the qualifying race, you know, these kind of differences. So how can I understand the tires better? All these kind of things. Of course, n next year the tires will be different again, so you have to learn that as well. But you always look in these kind of areas, like what can I understand or learn from all the, these experiences I've had so far? Next year, a completely different set of regulations. So yeah. it's still Formula One, but just not as we know it. The teams have been working on this for some time, so you get an early indication, maybe you've driven the simulated already. Can you explain a little bit to the, uh, the, the race fans out there, what will this new Formula One represent? How much slower will it be? Will it actually be better for racing? Is it going to be more suited to you? Is it more suited to Lewis? What can we expect? Uh, well, I mean, I like the current cars in terms of speed because it's really impressive how much grip you have. So the new cars definitely will be a few seconds slower, but of course that is with the idea of having better racing that you can follow a bit closer and that's what they want because at the moment, of course, when you get close, you have a lot of disturbance from the car in front. So I do hope that it's gonna happen. You know, the tires will look completely different, 18 inch. So um, 
yeah, again, different reaction from the tires as well. For sure, I have to adapt my driving to it because everyone always says, "What is your? How is your driving style like?" I'm like, I don't think I actually have one. It's just you adapt to the situation. That is your driving style because if the car is understeer, you have to adapt yourself to the understeer. If the car is oversteer, you have to adapt yourself to that. So there is not one. You cannot say, "This is my driving style. That's how I'm going to drive." It's impossible because sometimes it just doesn't work with the material you have. So. I think adaptation at the end of the day is key. We mentioned the 18 inch uh, rims and therefore smaller sidewalls. Um, when we raced in Formula One, it was with these big sidewalls. I have raced in other formulas with you know, bigger wheels and, and you have as well in sports cars and the like. I didn't really feel a big difference because you match the wheels and the, the wheel rate to the suspension. So is it really that big a talking point or? Uh, what I, I mean, I've only driven it on the sim, um, but it, it feels all a bit sharper, the, the reaction of the tires and uh, just the general traction you have out of corners feel a bit different. So yeah, I'm interested, of course, to see how it's gonna feel in real life. You've achieved your ultimate goal. You've won the World Championship and you've always said that that's enough for you. So what is the next motivation other than to take race by race? Well, everything that comes now is a bonus and I'm just gonna enjoy it. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, Isn't is. that so refreshing? Because I think that people imagine that you guys are so you know, selfish for, for success that if you don't do eight titles, then you know, you're somehow compared. But this championship seems to me that this is like eight titles in one. You need a bit of luck as well, isn't it, to, to be able to, to fight for seven or whatever, eight. Uh, you need a very dominant team to be able to do that. So you, know, you don't always have that luck or that you are not in that era. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. So for me, I always wanted to win one. And then, you know, you'll see what, where you go f from there. Um, and like I said, yeah, everything that comes now is a bonus. But that still, you know, that doesn't mean that if I lose a race, I, I will still be upset. But still, then maybe a few minutes after, I'll be like, it's okay. <laughs> so yes, Max is, is in this situation where, you know, incredible achievements this year, but at 24, you will still evolve as a man. That's just the way of life. Have you discovered something about yourself in this year's battle, this year's championship that you didn't know in your late 40s about yourself? Well, not really discovered. I think I knew myself already a little bit before that. So, uh, <laughs> but I must say, it, it was tense. And I, I think even in private life, they could feel that. You know, I was a bit more uh, quicker, angry, and, you know, because of things was what happened. And so uh, with this, I think now for me, it's, you know, it's done. And I'm really going to enjoy the coming months, you know, spend as much time at home. And, and to enjoy the little kids I have, and uh, yeah. Hopefully they're not going to drive though, because pff, to go through all no, of that again. Uh, go through it as an uncle, <laughs> can you imagine? Because probably at one point I, I have to pick up then. I can't. As a brother, sorry, I'm yeah, sorry. What yeah, am I saying yeah. uncle? I'm getting confused. You know, These are your <laughs> brothers <laughs> and sisters. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's for me, they don't need to race. You know, like just. They should play football, because then, you know, you can buy them new shoes and a new ball every single week, and it's still, <laughs> it's still way cheaper than racing, so. Yeah. yeah so. I'm experiencing that now because my 13 year old wants to race and wants to be in Formula One and he passes on his congratulations, of course. Um, it, it's fantastic for me to see how these, these the young teenagers are influenced it's, by... It's good for them, you know, it's competitive, they learn, you know, they, it's for, 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 to grow up, they get, they get a man quicker, you know, they, you have to stand up for yourself, as you know, and it's, for me, it's just a very good school, that's for sure. Yeah, here, here. Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure as always, and it's been wonderful on behalf of Carnex to, to share these insights the day after you became the latest Formula One World Championship family. Um, I think the best way to close this would be, Max, I don't know if you have a camera line there, but if you look down the camera, introduce yourself for those who don't know your name <laughs> as the 2021 Formula One World Champion. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, uh, of course, my name is Max Stappen and I like to drive in circles. And uh, yeah, we had a very good day yesterday. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, you know, I... I'm, what I'm what still, are you? What, I'm... I'm um, You're the 2021 Formula One World Champion. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. I still need to get used to it. <laughs> Can you say it for us? I think that's a wonderful way to close it. Yeah. Well, my name is Max Stappen and I'm the 2021 
world champion. Very fucking good as that. <laughs> Loved it. It was nice. Yeah, this is fucking awesome. It's yeah. fucking awesome, isn't it? It's like so cool. Yeah. Well done, son. <laughs>